Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are a hundred miles from your own line, waiting for the enemy who will lead you to your destination while the danger to you and your men becomes more acute. For if you are discovered, the only road of escape will be death. So listen now as Escape brings you the 13th truck, based on the story of Captain Douglas M. Smith. Some of the men called it a joyride. Two days before, we left headquarters at Cabrit, Egypt, circled Tobruk, sneaked across into Nazi-held territory. Destination? A Nazi airfield, a hundred miles behind enemy lines. A joyride? The next 24 hours could turn our army truck into a hearse. Just six of us in that truck. Sergeant Healy, a corporal, three enlisted men, Hutchins, Twombly, and Guppy... And myself, Captain Paul Ground, U.S. Army. I was the only American in the group. The others drafted from Montgomery's 8th Army. As a unit, we were called Desert Commandos. Our business? Sabotage. Study desert. Easy does it, Sergeant. Didn't see it, Captain. Sorry, sir. Break an axle, we're in big trouble. Listen to it. Think they was on a blooming joyride, you would. Uh, Captain. What? I was thinking... The men been wondering what they're in for this trip. Well, they'll hear about it tonight when we stop. That'll make them feel brighter. If a man's going to die, it makes him feel better if he knows why. Captain Brown, a plane, a plane. Where? East, about 8,000. I've picked them up with the glasses. Messer Schmidt. Can't tell yet too far. Pull up, Sergeant, over there with those rocks. Hurry. Yes, sir. Get the truck covered, men, and try not to raise any dust. What did yet, Captain? Now, Hutchins said to the east. Don't hear it. Hop to it with that cover, lads. Got it. It's a plane, all right. I can't tell what kind. It's coming this way. Pin them edges down with rocks. Make it look natural. It's a Messer Schmidt. Out of the truck, man. Messer Schmidt. Come on, let's go, Sergeant. Now keep it quiet, lads, and don't move. Yeah. He's coming in. Yeah. Think that camouflage net will fool him? Oh, that's what it's for. We're ducks in a ruddy pond if it doesn't. Who's moving back there? Beat the rat. Knock it, Hutchins. But there's ants crawling around in here, sir. Stuck right over an ant hill. I'm not sitting on it. Hey. Big red ants, Captain. Well, don't move. And whatever you do, don't touch that net. Hey! hey Shut your jaw, Corporal! They're all over the place. Captain. Hey, he's settling back. Okay, Jerry's gone. Come on. Now what, sir? I'll get that net loaded and let's get moving. We can put in another 50 miles before dark. At this rate, I guess we'll be driving right into Rummel's front yard, sir. Sergeant Healy scratched at an ant under his shirt, then turned and hustled the men into the truck, and we were on our way again. No 
singing now. The corporal stared across the desert from his side of the truck. Hutchins kept his eyes up where the Messerschmitts roamed. The rest just scraped away at the layers of dust and sweat, staring at each other. They covered 20 miles. 30. Zigzagging deeper into Nazi territory. Just before dark, we parked in some low-lying hills above the coast highway. Rommel's main artery of communication and supply to the front lines. It was time to tell the men what they were in for. Settle down, lads. Captain Brown has a word for you. In uh, case you're wondering where we are, we're right here. Oh, blimey, right down Jerry's throat. Yes, yeah, just about. Intelligence reports say the Germans have established a hidden airfield somewhere in uh, this area, right here. They're just off the coast highway. How do they know that, sir? Well, Nazi supply trucks have been spotted leaving the coast highway, taking a camel trail up into the hills. Right here. Now, they're supplying something up there. Headquarters is certain it's a hidden airfield. Oh, that explains all them fighter planes in the forward area. You're right. Yeah. Well, then, as I see it, sir, where to find that hidden airfield, sir? Find it, Corporal, and destroy it. Destroy it, sir? How? Go in and dynamite. Where do we get the dynamite? We've got it, Corporal. You've been sitting on it for the last couple of days. You mean them boxes in the truck? Ah, oh, dynamite. Hey, just the six of us are going to blow up this airfield? By ourselves, sir? That's a job, Hutchins. It keeps getting tougher all the time. What's that, Twombly? Nothing, Sarge. Uh, Captain, say we find the field. How do we get close enough to use the dynamite? Uh, well, close won't do, Sergeant. You mean we're going right into the ruddy place, sir? That's right, Corporal. That's where we can do the most damage. One more question, sir. How do we get inside the airfield? Yeah, like we drive in. Drive in? Oh, I can just see them Nazis letting us drive into their airfield with a truckload of explosives. <laughs> now, as soon as it's dark, we move on to that next hill up ahead. From there, we watch that camel road that comes up from the coast highway. We'll rest up there all day tomorrow. Then tomorrow night, after dark, we'll leave a sentinel at the top of the hill. That'll be you, Hutchins. Yes, sir. Then we'll move the truck down and park at a sharp curve within 20 yards of the camel road and wait. Wait for what, sir? For you to spot a German supply convoy on its way up to the camel road. You're to wait and count exactly the number of trucks in the convoy and the distance separating them. Yes, sir. Now, when you've got that information, you come back and report. Then we wait until the Jerry convoy comes around the curve. We let all but the last truck pass by, and before this last truck comes in sight, around the curve, we'll cut into the road and fall in line. You get the picture now, Corporal? Yes, sir, only... Uh, well, why don't we fall in at the end of the convoy? Oh, come off it, Corp. And have them Jerry's in the last truck get suspicious when another truck comes up behind them? I'm paid to fight, not to think so. All right, Corp. Then for once, you'll have a chance to earn your pay. <laughs> After dark, we moved on to the hill overlooking a long stretch of the camel road, a short distance from the sharp curve. We broke open the dynamite and attached time mechanisms. We finished preparations just before daylight, and the men covered the truck with a camouflage net and turned in for some sleep. With the sun, it got hot under the net, then hotter, plus the flies. And the flies reminded me of a of another place on a hillside in Ohio. Sandwiches, potato salad, and a girl. Dark eyes, dark hair, laughing and pushing me away. I'd forgotten her name. I I wanted to kiss her, but she was worried about the flies on the potato salad. What was her name? Jane. No. Elaine? Eileen. <laughs> and she let me kiss her. Lips cool. Nice. We forgot about the potato salad and the flies. Ah, blasted flies! Uh, Captain. Huh? Uh, oh, what's the matter, Sergeant? Getting dark, sir. Oh, yeah. First yeah. time you've slept since we left Cabritza. 
Uh, you needed it. Yeah. You were dreaming? Yeah. Your wife, sir? No. <clears throat> Just a lady friend. Just something that happened a long time ago. Oh, I remember a bit of strawberry jam. In Naples, it was. She tended bar in one of them places you can never find when you go back. She never meant nothing to me. Funny thing, I try to remember her name. Never comes to me. <sighs> oh, this heat. Dripping wet. I guess we better get the man up. In a few minutes, the men were up on the truck with packs of dynamite on their backs. We left Hutchins on the hill to watch for the approaching convoy and moved down and parked 20 yards from the sharp curve in the camel road. Now we waited. Two hours passed. Three. Four. No sign of the German truck convoy. What do we do if no convoy comes through tonight, sir? Try again tomorrow night. Oh. Five hours. Still waiting. I began to think of the things that could go wrong now. I considered the possibility that Hutchins might have fallen asleep up on the hill. There were patrols scouting the area. What if one of them discovered us? It would be a run for our lives then. We needed darkness to get at that airfield, and there was only a few hours of it left. Still, we waited. No convoy. I was about to send the corporal to relieve Hutchins when he came scrambling down the hill. Hey, hey, they're coming, Captain. Gary Convoy. Twelve trucks. Twelve? You're positive, Hutchins? I'm positive, sir. I counted them three times. Twelve trucks about a hundred yards apart, averaging 30 miles an hour. Good. Climb aboard, Hutchins. On your toes, man. Now count each truck as it passes. We move in behind the 11th truck. I just thought of something, sir. What? What are they going to think if they count 13 trucks when we reach the airfield when there were only 12 trucks to begin with? Well, we'll figure that one out when we get to it. Here they come, Captain. First Jerry trucks coming around the bend. We will return to escape in just a moment. But first... CBS Radio wishes to call your attention to a new five-a-week daytime show on many of these same stations under the expert guidance of Jack Sterling. This new show asks members of the panel to make up your mind over problems with a psychological twist. The first week's guest list on Make Up Your Mind included Ilka Chase, Wendy Berry, Deems Taylor, Earl Wilson, and Vic Marcillo, former manager of Jersey Joe Walcott. And now, back to Escape. The first truck of the Nazi convoy roared around the curve and passed. Thirty seconds later, another one. All we could see was two pinpoints of dim light coming at us, a dark shadow as it passed, and a tiny red light at the back of the truck. Three. Four. Five trucks. Then a command car. Now, what if the number 11 or 12 were command cars? They'd stop to investigate the sudden appearance of a truck at the end of the convoy. Well, we'd take a chance. Truck number seven. Eight. Nine. Two more. Start your engine, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Here comes number ten. out behind the next truck, Sergeant. And no headlights until we're in line. Right, sir. Here 
Here it comes. Eleven, let's go. Now. Your lights. On. Truck number 12 just came around the curve. About 50 yards back. A little faster, Sergeant. Number 12 is dropping back now. Good. Only that's number 13 back there, Corporal. We're number 12 now. <laughs> now keep your eyes peeled for that airfield. We'll have to do something about the extra truck in this convoy before we get there. In the meantime, sit tight and enjoy the ride. Uh, what did you say, Twombly? Nothing. Nothing at all, Sarge. All right. Settle back, boys, and enjoy the ride. Enjoy the blooming ride? With all them jerrys in front and behind us? I'll enjoy the ruddy side more on the return trip, I can tell you. Trouble with you, Atchins. You're a stinking pessimist. Oh. Serve your ruddy well right if we're all blown to blazes. <laughs> The following half hour was uneventful. We moved along, keeping our place in line, watching the other trucks, watching for the airfield. Seeing nothing but a small red dot ahead, two gray dots behind. Then the corporal noticed something about those two gray lights behind us. They grew larger, came closer. Captain, the rear truck is moving up on us. I think they want us to stop. What for? How should I know? What will we do, sir? Pull up. Right. Now, Corporal, your German's better than mine. You do the talking. Right, sir. The rest of you keep your knives handy. No guns. There might be sentries along the road. Michael. Michael. They want a match. Neither of our boys have one. Uh oh. What's up, sir? Corporal gave him his lighter. The Jerry says it's a French one. Oh, it's okay. He covered. Says he got it off a French major. All clear. Good work, Corporal. Okay, let's go. We've got to catch up with the convoy before they come back looking for us. Yes, sir. And if we don't spot that airfield pretty soon, I'm going to have conniptions, I am. We caught up and took our place again. We were about to reach the Nazi airfield soon, so I gave the men their final instructions. There was still one truck too many in the convoy that had to be taken care of. Then we topped a height and spotted a cluster of pinpoint lights up ahead. This had to be the hidden Nazi airfield. I gave the sergeant the order to swerve the truck across the road, blocking it. All right, a couple of you circle around behind them as they reach us. Hurry. Here they come. Motor trouble, Corporal. Right, sir. The motor is zusammengebrochen, Kamerad. Rollen Sie Hilfe! Ja. Here they come, sir. Only two. Now! (laughs) That does it. Okay, transfer everything to the Jerry truck. Fast! Now, Twomley, you take our truck and hide it in that wadi off the road. Stay with it. We'll rally back here no more than 15 minutes from now. Now, you got that, man? Got it. And, Twomley, this is an order. Wait here for 15 minutes. Then start back to the base, even if you have to go back alone. Yes, sir. Just as we caught up with the Jerry convoy, the truck ahead pulled through the front gate. Two guards leisurely watched each truck as it passed under a spotlight. We moved up, slowly. 
in our proper position. We reached the gate. The guards didn't move. Then we were through the gate. And inside, we'd made it. The other trucks parked about a hundred yards further on. We pulled up at the end of the line and we got out, stalling as much as possible. The light over the front gate went out. The other drivers were gone now. It was quiet and dark. Come on. Quiet. Okay. Okay, now, hold it here. We'll split up now. Corporal, you and Guffey take that side of the field. Look for planes. Hutchins, you work on those buildings along there. Sergeant, we'll take this side of the field on the hangars. What, sir? Now, make sure you plant that dynamite where it'll do the most good. Good luck. Come on, Sergeant. There's the bunker, Captain. In here. Captain, look. Yeah, three planes, all fighters. There must be at least half a dozen bunkers along this side of the field, with planes in all of them. We've hit the jackpot, Captain. Yeah, now, you start at the other end, Sergeant. Work your way back. I'll meet you here in three minutes. Right, sir. I found three bunkers, planes in each of them. A squad structure with a sign out front, Octone Explosives. I poked two loads under that one. Then a warehouse, a bulldozer, trucks, cars, and three barracks buildings. From somewhere in the pitch black, I could hear voices laughing and talking. Then I was back at the first bunker, and the sergeant moved out of the dark. He was smiling. The plane's in all them bunkers, and I got a fuel reservoir while I was at it, sir. Good. Let's get out of here. Hi! We've been spotted. The sergeant cut the guard down before he could pull a rifle off his shoulder. Spotlights went on everywhere. Other guards came running. Then a door opened behind us. Excited figures rushed out and stopped dead in their tracks when they saw us. We stood there face to face with half a dozen surprised Nazi officers. The sergeant whipped his machine gun around. And they dropped one after another right at our feet. All but one. He stumbled forward right into the sergeant's arms. The sergeant held him as a shield with one arm and went right on firing the other. Make for the main gate, sergeant. I'm for that, captain. We moved through patches of darkness and smoke, dragging the Nazi officer with us. The guards were firing in wild confusion. And then a strange thing happened. As we moved under the light at the main gate, the Jerry's quit firing at us. They were all around us, but out of sight. Silent. Watching us. We made a perfect target, but not a shot was fired. I couldn't figure it out. I, I don't get it, Captain. What are they waiting for? I don't know. Maybe it's that Jerry officer you got there. Him? He don't look important. Battle fatigues, no rank insignia. Nothing but that campaign medal. Well, hang on to him just the same. <laughs> don't worry. Hello? What? The main gate's closed. Looks locked. Yeah. How are we going to get out? Look. There was a staff car parked just 15 yards away. We moved to it, wondering how long it would be before the guards made up their minds to start shooting again. The sergeant got in the back with a Nazi officer, and I started the car and headed right for the gate. And then we were through. Let's get away from this bloody place. Them explosives is going off any second now. See if any of them pull out after us. I don't think so. Not yet. Well, the Wadi should be up around that bend in the road. Wonder how many of the men made it back. We'll soon find out. Right, there she goes. The sky turned white, then red as the shockwave crashed against us. The car swerved from side to side. The shells from the ammo dump screamed in at us from every direction, tearing the landscape open everywhere. I could hardly hold the car on the road and moving. Finally, the road curved around a hill, offering some protection from the bombardment of the explosions. Oh, did we do all that, sir? Looks like it. That was meant for you, Fritz. Hey, come back here, you! What's wrong? He's trying to jump! I can't! Hold him! Oh! He got away! Pull up! I'm going after him! Now it's too dark. Never find him now anyway. Lost! We 
found the men waiting at the wadi. They piled into the Nazi staff car and there were six of us again. Yep, all six. Operation completed and we didn't lose a man. We still had a long, hazardous drive back to our lines, but it was different now. It was going home. I drove and the sergeant sat next to me. He was brooding about the Nazi officer. Cheer up, Sergeant. Maybe you can get yourself another on the next raid. I suppose. Well, anyhow, I got a souvenir. Part of his jacket, too. Ever see a Jerry medal like that before, Captain? I haven't. Oh, yeah, that's... That's... What's the matter, sir? Holy. What's the matter? You you got this off that officer? Yes, sir. What? Uh, do you know what it is? No, sir. What? Well, it's the Hitler Knight's Cross. Hitler Knight's Cross? Yeah, the Fuhrer's personal medal. There's only three that he's ever given out. Oh, sir? Three. Garing got one. One for von Rundstedt. What about the other? Rommel. Take your pick, Sergeant. Which one of them did we have? Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you The Thirteenth Truck, adapted by Gus Bays, from the story of Captain Douglas M. Smith, as told to Cecil Carnes, starring High Everback as Captain Brown, with Richard Peel as the sergeant. Featured in the cast were Alastair Duncan, Charlie Lung, Alec Harford, and Jack Crucian. The special music for Escape was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are the subject of an experiment. An experiment to make you the most powerful man on earth. While if it succeeds from that moment on, you will be forever locked in a world from which there can be no escape. So listen next week when Escape will bring you Irving Reese's extraordinary story... The Man from Tomorrow. A sensational trial of old San Francisco in 1870 will be your crime classic on CBS Radio tomorrow evening. The title, The Incredible Trial of Laura D. Fair. It's a long title, but whether you have a short or long memory, don't miss this exciting story of Mrs. Fair's incredible trial, dramatized by CBS Radio on Crime Classics tomorrow evening over most of these same stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, there's action as a policeman really finds it in 21st Precinct, Tuesdays on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>